there gardener welcome to my april garden guide which gives you ideas on things to either start from seed or transplant right now along with expert tips and garden task reminders to help keep you on track i do a garden guide every month so if you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel so you don't miss a single one you can find my monthly garden guides in my monthly garden guides playlist or join my email group and i will send you the guide automatically at the beginning of each month i will link all of these things in the description below if you are new here hello and welcome my name is jara and i teach people how to garden and grow food so you've come to the right place if you want to improve your gardening skills all right let's get started with this guide the majority of the united states should be past their last spring frost dates or passing it this month in april i know there are a few of you that have last spring frost dates a bit further even into may therefore as i review each crop category i will say if you passed your last spring frost date then do this if you haven't passed it then do this i just want to be a little bit more accurate for everybody if you do not know your last spring frost date then please visit this website right here enter in your zip code and it will give you an estimated date this date is very important to know because you will backtrack from here to figure out when to sow seeds or figure out when you can start planting outside okay let's talk about all the things that can be started from seed or transplanted this month i'm going to go through each crop but just know that i probably have a dedicated growing guide specific for that crop that will give step-by-step -step directions on how to grow it from seed so if one exists i will link all of that stuff below in the description and don't forget to check out my website if you want to find seeds or plants for anything that I mentioned in my videos. Our very first crop is beans, all sorts of beans. If you're past your last spring frost date, you can safely direct sow seeds for beans right now. If you're not past your last spring frost date, either wait or you can sow one bean seed per cell of a 72 cell seed tray three weeks before your last spring frost date to basically grow out your own plug and get an early start on your bean season. Now let me discuss the differences across the bean types because there's a lot to choose from. If you want to grow a standard green bean, go for bush or pole beans like these right here. Bush bean plants are compact, staying around one to one and a half feet tall, so they're great for small spaces or under other bigger crops like tomatoes and peppers. Pole beans grow very long vines, so they produce a lot more, but require a trellis to grow up on. Cow peas or southern peas like these right here tolerate high heat conditions a lot better than traditional green beans. They usually grow into low sprawling types of bushy plants that have short vines, which is great for blocking weeds. They produce a lot of beans best eaten as fresh fresh beans and produce over a much longer period of time when compared to traditional green beans. Lima beans like these Christmas beans usually are vining plants too. They can be harvested and eaten fresh or dry the seeds so they can be stored over a long period of time. The beans also tend to be pretty big in size. Lastly, we have yard long beans like these right here. Yard long beans are the most heat tolerant bean type thing that I grow right here in my garden. They handle the tropical light conditions that I get during the summer here in my Florida garden. The bush, pole, and lima beans can not. They basically start dying once the extreme heat and rains of my summer arrives. So I switched to growing yard long beans and the cow peas or southern peas during the summer specifically. Moving along, our next crop is corn. If you're past your last spring frost date, you can begin direct sowing seeds for corn. And that's all sorts of corn, sweet corn, dent, popcorn, or flint corn. I have issues getting good germination when I direct sow corn seeds. So I start them indoors in 72 cell seed trays. I put the trays over a heat mat or inside of a mini greenhouse. So it's nice and warm, which helps with germination. Once the seedlings are about three weeks old, they're ready to be transplanted into the garden. If you're not past your last spring frost date, you can sow corn seeds three weeks before your last spring frost date to get a head start on the season. This technique is not so practical if you're growing fields of corn. In that case, it's better to direct sow the seeds. But for small backyard home gardeners like me with just a few beds of corn, this technique works out great. And this leads me into the next crop to start growing this month, squash. I like to grow squash underneath my corn plants because they sprawl out under the corn, block out weeds, and maximize how many things I can grow in the same space. If you add a vining type of bean in the mix as well, it will grow up the corn stalks for vertical support. This gardening strategy comes from Native Americans and is called Three Sisters Gardening. If you're past your last spring frost date, you can direct sow seeds for squash. If you're not past your last spring frost date, you can sow one, maybe two squash seeds in a four inch size pot indoors about six to eight weeks before your last spring frost date. Now just three pro tips when it comes to growing squash so you guys will be successful. Successful. Number one, I say this all the time. If you struggle to grow squash because of squash bugs or the dreaded squash vine borer, I highly recommend that you choose squash cultivars in one of these two groups. These type of squash cultivars have extra thick and woody stems that make it hard for the bugs to get into, and they have higher disease tolerances. I'm not saying you won't get any pests or diseases, it's just that these are extra tough plants that will tolerate more disease and pest pressure before ultimately giving out and dying. So this will increase your chances of harvesting something. Tip number two, the worm
worms and caterpillars will come. Some of you don't have such a bad issue with chewing insects like worms and caterpillars. I wish that was my situation here in Florida. They just get insane here. Ideally, I would love to just hand pick them off my plants so I don't have to use a spray, but I get so many here in my Florida garden, it's impossible to keep up with it. So if that's your situation too, use BT spray, which is an organic spray. I will link to the one that I use in the description below. Please be careful though when using any kind of spray, even if it's organic, spray only the affected plants, do not spray flowers, and only spray in the evening when the pollinators have left for the day. That way everything is dry before they return in the morning of the next day. BT is only effective if the pest chews a leaf and ingests it. Bees and butterflies don't chew leaves, so it doesn't really affect them, but it will kill butterfly caterpillars. So don't spray butterfly caterpillar host plants. Please do not use a product like Seven Dust, that just kills everything. And my third tip is if you get any kind of leaf diseases, especially powdery mildew with squash, spray with one cup of hydrogen peroxide per gallon of water. That's the only thing I use to treat all sorts of leaf diseases. And I say it in almost all my videos because it works. I'm gonna tell you right now, squash and tomatoes are probably the most difficult crops to grow for gardeners in hot climates with high disease and pest pressure. So give yourself some slack and if they get a disease or pest, it's normal, don't freak out. And I wanted to show you guys this beautiful flower. I had to do my video right next to it because it's just gorgeous. This is edible chrysanthemum. Usually the leaves are used like in Asian cuisine as like a cooked green or in stir fries and things like that. But the flowers are also edible and you can dry them to make tea. I don't think it's the same exact chrysanthemum variety used to make official chrysanthemum tea, but you could still make tea with it. But I didn't even plant these here on purpose. These actually reseeded from last season and I am totally fine with that. You probably hear me say it quite often. If something is so happy in my garden that it decides to reseed, I am totally fine with that and I just leave it right where it is. So not only are these flowers just beautiful, they're like the epitome of spring to me, but the entire plant is edible too. And I definitely have seeds on my website if you want to try growing it. Okay, so moving on to the next crop, greens. This category is drastically different between what I call hot climate and cold climate gardeners. So let me break it down for you. You are a hot climate gardener if you have hot summers with days consistently above 90 degrees Fahrenheit and mild winters where it doesn't snow and your ground doesn't freeze. Most likely that is South USA garden zones eight and up, even though some of you zone eight people do get snow. You are a cold climate gardener if you have temperate summers. I kind of think of Minnesota or Michigan where your summer day highs are like in the 70s and 80s. I'm sure you get the occasional heat wave, but it's not 90 degrees Fahrenheit or higher every single day like me here in Florida. And then you have cold winters with snow. Most likely this is those of you in zone seven and below or you zone eight and nine people in the Pacific Northwest. If you're a hot climate gardener, stop planting cool season greens like lettuce and spinach in this month of April. It is time to transition over to heat tolerant tropical greens like these right here. The cool weather stuff is just gonna get stunted in growth and bolt, which means go to the flowering stage and taste bitter due to being exposed to too much heat. These tropical alternative type greens will carry you through summer. There are a few greens that you might get away with if you sow seeds or transplant right now, like these right here. And I mean it when I say like right now, the early part of April. These are more heat tolerant than most, so you should be able to harvest before things really start to heat up. Or try growing the cool season greens indoors if you can. If you're a hot climate gardener watching this video, the number one tip that I want you to get out of this video for the month of April is to stop planting cool season or spring crops. I am planting summer now. Yes, plant summer now. The goal is to harvest everything out before summer comes and kills everything or just makes gardening very difficult. If you're a cold climate gardener, you can plant cool season greens like these right here, but only if you're past your last spring frost date. If you're not past your last spring frost date, then sow seeds indoors about six to eight weeks before your last spring frost date. So I figured I would show you what I have growing in my green stock garden towers because this is just looking amazing. And this is basically stuff that I recommend right now for the cold climate gardeners, not the hot climate. I started these from seed in March, just as one last attempt to hurry up and grow some more different kind of cool season greens, like all of these different lettuces here. I've got bok choy. This white stem canton bok choy is my absolute favorite bok choy ever. So this one's really good. And I've got some arugula here, which I was not a big fan of arugula until I started growing it myself, but in particular, the baby greens. They taste really good. They don't have a really hard, like that arugula peppery type flavor, more like mustard greens and things like that. It's a little bit more mellowed out, but very savory, super delicious. So I harvest these when they're super tiny like this. So I've got the arugula here, and then I kind of switched it out with some tat soy as well. Tat soy is my favorite substitute for spinach because it's very hard for me to grow spinach here in my zone 10A garden. It's possible, I have grown it before, but it just honestly doesn't get cold enough for it to be happy and really grow big 
big and lush in my garden. But tatsoi is a near perfect substitute. It chops like it, it cooks like it. I use it in all of the same recipes that I would use spinach, but it doesn't have that strong spinachy type flavor, but still it tastes great. So if you're a hot climate gardener, definitely recommend planting some tatsoi right now in April if you can. And then the last here at the very bottom, I planted a bunch of Swiss chard. I love eating the baby greens of Swiss chard. Not so much the bigger ones, but the baby greens are really good. And these stems are all different colors. So just really, really beautiful. And when this gets more filled out as the season progresses, it's gonna look so gorgeous. And of course I probably have seeds for all this stuff on my website. These are all the different kinds of lettuces that I currently have on my website. I wanted to plant all of them really quick before my season ended. But yeah, if you're a cold climate gardener, you can direct sow seeds for all of this stuff right now. If you're a hot climate gardener, I only recommend tatsoi and the Canton bok choy at this moment. But anyways, back to my cold climate gardeners, the next category is just for you. And that would be things in the brassicas family. If you still have like eight to 12 weeks before your last spring frost date, you can start sowing seeds for things in the brassicas family, like these things right here. Or you can transplant them as soon as your last spring frost date has passed. I do not recommend any of these brassicas for hot climate gardeners right now. It is just gonna get way too hot. Instead, plan on sowing seeds indoors in July or August to transplant them in September or October. They grow better during the fall, winter, and early spring for hot climates with mild winters. Next up, we have herbs. It is okay to either transplant or direct sow seeds for all sorts of herbs if you're past your last spring frost date. Here are some ideas of herbs that I love to grow. They're a must grow for me every single season. Many of these are host plants for various butterflies and attract loads of beneficials to your garden. If you're absolutely past all danger of frost, then you can also plant these types of tropical herbs. Some of these can be started from seed while others are grown from cuttings or root pieces, like ginger, for example, which is grown from a rhizome. These tropical herbs will carry you through the summer when all the traditional European herbs start to die off from just way too much heat or rain. If you're not past your last spring frost date, then start sowing seeds for herbs indoors six to eight weeks before your last spring frost date. And I really love to sow rows and rows of herbs in these 72 cell seed trays so I can grow a lot of them at once. Or if you have existing plants in your garden, you can can propagate by taking cuttings. This method is much faster than starting all the way from seed. Our next crop are onions. I have a whole bunch of them growing in this green stock garden tower, but I also have them all over my garden in general because a lot of pests are kind of repelled by the smell of things in the allium family. So I love to interplant onions just everywhere, but I got to break this one down between hot and cold climate gardeners. If you're a hot climate gardener, we transplant onions in the fall. So they grow over the winter and get harvested sometime in spring. So it's too late to be planting bulbing onions right now. Just to give you an idea, I sow onion seeds in July to transplant in October, but you can sow seeds or transplant other things in the allium family like chives and bunching onions right now in April. If you're a cold climate gardener, you're supposed to sow onion seeds two to three months before your last spring frost date so they're ready to transplant as soon as all danger of freeze has passed. If you're late to sowing onion seeds and your last spring frost date is approaching, then purchase onion transplants and plant them once you're past your last spring frost date. The next group of crops is another one for our cold climate friends only, and that would be radish, beets, and turnips. If you're a cold climate gardener, then go ahead and direct sow seeds once you're past your last spring frost date. If you're a hot climate gardener, it's too late for these things. You can direct sow seeds again in fall. And another crop for cold climate gardeners is peas. You guys can direct sow seeds for lots of peas, sweet peas, snap peas, and snow peas. Once you're past your last spring frost date, that is. They are so easy to grow and have a much higher sugar content when eaten fresh or recently harvested when compared to the ones that you buy at the grocery store. Peas are usually ready to start harvesting in about two and a half months too, so very quick to harvest from seed. Peas do not like the heat though. If exposed to too much heat, the vines start to dry out and turn brown, like what you see here. If you're a hot climate gardener, pea season has passed. Plan to sow more seeds for peas in October and November to grow through fall and winter. If you're past your last spring frost date, you can start direct sowing seeds or transplanting all sorts of flowers. If you're not past your last spring frost date, then sow seeds indoors six to eight weeks before for your last spring frost date to get an early start. Just like the herbs, I like to sow rows and rows of flowers in 72 cell seed trays. You could potentially take cuttings and propagate a whole bunch too. Flowers should be an integral part of your garden because they are host plants for various butterflies and they attract pollinators and beneficial insects. Spring is a great time to start a butterfly garden. I recommend these flowers right here. If you wanna attract more bees and other pollinators, then I recommend these flowers right here. 
Hot climate gardeners that are past their last spring frost dates can plant flower bulbs like these right here. These types of flowers tolerate the heat much better than others. Cold climate gardeners that are past their last spring frost dates can plant cool season flower bulbs like these right here. These flower bulb recommendations are general guidelines because there are some exceptions. For example, dahlias don't like extreme heat, but if I plant them in February, they will grow and bloom for me, but die off once the extreme heat of my Florida summer arrives. They are not perennials for me, but they bloom during the summer and are perennial in colder climates. Some cultivars are more heat tolerant than others. So experiment. You might be pleasantly surprised by what will grow in your garden. If you're past your last spring frost date and are a hot climate gardener like South USA zones eight and up, you can start planting tropical root crops like these right here. If you're growing your own sweet potato slips from a tuber, then hurry up and get started because that whole process takes like two months. Or go online and order some slips so they're delivered in time for planting. If you're a cold climate gardener like zone seven and below, it gets very difficult or just not possible to grow some of these tropical root crops. Yucca, for example, is not ready for harvest until about nine to 12 months after planting, and your cold winter will just kill the whole plant before you're able to harvest. You can plant things like ginger and turmeric in a big pot and just bring it indoors during the winter. If you wanna grow some sweet potatoes, you need to plant slips as soon as your soil warms up. So depending on when that occurs, you might need to start growing out your own slips right now in April. Cold climates have a very short window to grow sweet potatoes, as they require at minimum three months in a row of warm temperatures to grow and produce. Personally, I don't like to harvest my sweet potatoes until around the fifth or sixth month. The longer you leave them in the ground, the larger the tuber will be at harvest time. Cold climate gardeners can plant potatoes though. Plant seed potatoes into the ground, or my preference is to grow them in grow bags two to three weeks before your last spring frost date. If you're a hot climate gardener, do not plant potatoes right now. You can plant seed potatoes from October through November. They are a winter crop for us. This brings me to our next crop, which is another root crop, carrots. If you're a hot climate gardener, carrot season is over. You should be harvesting out your carrots by this point. You can start direct sowing seeds for carrots again in September. The rest of you cold climate gardeners can go ahead and direct sow carrot seeds if you're past your last spring frost date. The next category of crops is cucumbers and melons. By melons, I mean like watermelons, cantaloupes, that kind of thing. I gotta break this one down because it gets a little tricky. If you passed your last spring frost date way back in January, February, like me here in zone 10A, or March, you should have direct sowed or transplanted all of those things by now. I say this because they take two to three months to start producing. If you direct sowed seeds right now in April, you will start harvesting in June when things are crazy hot and the disease and pest pressure is insane. My goal is to harvest all of my cucumbers and melons before June. So if you have not direct sowed seeds for them yet, you might get away with using transplants right now. I also suggest you choose Asian cucumber cultivars at this point like China Jade, Soyu Nishiki, or Suyo Long, because they are more heat tolerant than traditional pickling or market fresh eating types of cucumbers. If you're passing your last spring frost date right now in April, then you're fine to direct sow seeds or use transplants once that frost date has passed. The rest of you, which would be cold climate gardeners with last spring frost dates in May or beyond, if that exists, you can get an early start on your cucumber and melon season by sowing seeds indoors in four inch pots about six to eight weeks before your last spring frost date. And speaking of flowers, I wanted to show you guys all of these nasturtiums that I have growing here. They're in all sorts of different colors. I didn't even plant these here. Nasturtiums just start popping up around my garden. If you're a hot climate gardener, nasturtiums grow better for us fall, winter, and spring. When the summer heat arrives, they start dying off. There's nothing you can do about it. But nasturtiums attract a lot of beneficial insects to the garden, so that's what got me into growing them. But I just started noticing something this season that I never noticed before, maybe because I didn't have so many growing in my garden. I mean, they're all over the place. But I was out here during the evening, and I just kind of noticed a scent that was like a mild jasmine flower type of scent and I was like what is that because I, I don't grow jasmine flowers here in my garden and I found out it was actually the nasturtiums so they have a mild type of fragrance and you really notice it more in the evening time when things cool down and these are edible as well they're delicious they have a peppery flavor that's very similar to arugula in my opinion. So these are just gorgeous on top of a salad or something like that. You wanna make your dishes look a little bit more gourmet. But yeah, there's all sorts of different kinds of nasturtiums in loads of different colors. If you've never grown nasturtiums before, you have to give it a try. Okay, let's talk about my favorite thing to grow and that's tomatoes. And then we'll talk about peppers and eggplants. If you're a hot climate gardener, you should be growing tomatoes starting in fall to be grown through winter and early spring. Summer heat and rains kill off my tomato plants. You 
usually by the end of June. I'm zone 10A, so those of you in zones 8 and 9 where it's a little less hot than me can get tomatoes to survive a little bit more longer into your summer. So what I mean to say is you should be harvesting tomatoes by now, not just getting around to transplanting them and definitely not just getting around to starting them from seed. You might get away with transplanting a decent sized hybrid cherry tomato or Everglades tomatoes because they tolerate the heat better, but that's it. Plant to sow seeds indoors in July to transplant in September. If you're not past your last spring frost date, then you can sow tomato seeds indoors six to 12 weeks before your last spring frost date. I highly recommend you use some kind of additional light source because tomato seedlings need lots of light to grow properly. I used 5,000 Kelvin or higher shop lights for many years and my tomato seedlings were ready to transplant in about 10 to 12 weeks. Last season was the first time I switched to official grow lights and my tomato seedlings were ready in six weeks. That's a huge difference. So if you don't have 10 to 12 weeks until your last spring frost date, then I highly recommend you get some official grow lights to speed this up and get them ready in half the time. I'm using Mars Hydro 3x3 grow lights that I got from Amazon, which I will link below in the description. I'm not sponsored by them or anything. I purchased these lights with my own money. So it is an honest recommendation based on actual results that I get in my garden. Now let's discuss peppers and eggplants. These things take forever to grow and get to a decent transplant size, even when using grow lights. They take around three months or so. So if you don't have three months before your last spring frost date, then get some transplants and plant them outside once all danger of frost has passed. Peppers and eggplants get stunted in growth and basically stall out when exposed to cold temperatures like 65 degrees Fahrenheit and below. Until then, keep the plants nice and warm in a greenhouse or indoors over heat mats. My goal is to transplant peppers and eggplants in March, so I'm harvesting in May and June. After that, it usually gets so hot the plants stop producing. They start growing and producing again in fall once the temperatures drop. The only exception is hot peppers. Those things keep growing straight through the heat. They definitely have higher heat, disease, and pest tolerances than sweet peppers. Moving on to the next crop, asparagus. Once you're past your last spring frost date, you can plant asparagus crowns. I highly recommend you purchase two-year-old crowns so you start harvesting sooner rather than later. Most people say you can't harvest them for at least two years. This is to allow the root systems to grow and get very large. A larger root system means that plant will produce more asparagus spears. This is generally true, but personally, I start harvesting them if the plant is sending up spears that are as thick as my fingers. That's a pretty good indicator that the root system underneath the ground is pretty robust. I've been successful growing asparagus in my zone 10A garden. I can't say for sure if they will grow well in hotter climates like zone 10B or 11 or 12. If you're in those zones and have successfully grown asparagus, please comment below. I'm curious how much heat they can take. You can also grow asparagus from seeds right now in April. They germinate and grow pretty easy. I like to grow them in solo cups and once they get big enough, pot that up into one gallon containers. Once they outgrow the one gallon container, I transplant them. This whole process can take like six months. They're easy to start from seed, but it just takes a while. Up next, we have some tropical heat loving crops like these right here. I lump all of these plants together because they require warmth to germinate, grow quickly, and get to harvest time. Hot climate gardeners can start sowing seeds indoors, direct sow seeds, or transplant them once all danger of frost has passed. Cold climate gardeners will have to sow seeds indoors to get a head start on the season as all of these things require a long warm growing season before they are ready for harvest except okra which starts producing in like two and a half to three months. Loofah takes five to six months before you harvest your first completely dried out loofah sponge. If you harvest them while they're still green then maybe you'll start harvesting at four months. Moringa and pigeon peas take six months or more. Roselle should be planted as soon as all danger of frost has passed and it won't start producing until the daylight hours have decreased in fall. This plant is triggered to start flowering and producing when that happens. For me, that's like in October. I say all of this to put it into perspective for cold climate gardeners. You might not have four to six months of a warm season to grow these things and harvest. You will have to calculate to see if it's possible for you. And I just have a question for you more experienced green stock gardeners. Have you successfully grown indeterminate beefsteak tomatoes in one of these? I'm growing a bunch of micro dwarf and dwarf cultivars, which I know they'll be fine in this because the dwarf varieties get up to around three feet at most. And then these micro dwarf are like one feet. So I know they're fine in here. They don't have very big root systems and they'll fit in this green stock garden tower okay and grow for me. However, have you tried growing indeterminates? Because I'm in Florida. My tomato season is like nine months in a row. By the end of my season, some of them have 15, 20, 25 foot long vines unless I cut them all down. So I really don't know how you would grow something like that in one of these. And I'm pretty sure their root systems are pretty big, definitely much bigger than this container here. So I'm just asking, maybe somebody has a great idea or technique of how to
how to do that. So if you've been successful growing indeterminate beef steaks in here, let me know in the comments, tag me in photos on social media, whatever you got to do. On to the next category of edible things, fruiting trees and plants. Once you're past your last spring frost day, you can start planting these things into the garden. I absolutely love my fruit trees. I try to plant and select fruit trees in such a way that there is something that can be harvested at any month out of the year. Growing perennial fruit trees and plants along with your favorite annual veggie crops is super important. You should not be totally reliant on annual veggie crops only. For one, annual veggie crops are much harder to grow and are more susceptible to pests and diseases than perennial native edible fruit trees and plants. This is a very smart strategy to help ensure food security in case you have a crop failure and to just be more self-sufficient. Now I know some of you don't have garden space to plant a whole fruit tree, like if you're gardening on a balcony, for example. But I bet a lot of you with smaller backyards like me think you don't have space for a fruit tree. So let me show you how close you can plant them. I plant my fruit trees six to eight feet apart. They are growing great and I get tons of production, definitely enough for my household needs. The secret is to choose dwarf cultivars and to heavily prune them. My backyard is way too small for a full-size 35 foot tall mango tree, but it can't fit a dwarf variety like a carry mango tree, which only gets 15 feet at maturity. And the other secret is that you have to heavily prune your fruit trees down to a manageable height. I don't let my fruit trees go beyond 12 feet or so because then it's very difficult for me to reach up to the top to harvest everything. And a lot of the fruit would go to waste. Commercial farms have machinery and equipment to harvest fruit that is way up high. I don't have that, so I keep these trees very short. A lot of the newer cultivars are self-fertile too, meaning that you just need one tree to get production, not a whole orchard. And you can also grow a lot of them in large containers too, just saying. So take a look at your backyard right now. Do you have space to plant some fruit trees now that I showed you how close they can be? If so, then I recommend these fruit trees and plants right here. And actually the first five in this list are probably the easiest that I recommend, especially if you're just getting into planting fruit trees and plants. Right here, I have two lychee trees. They're probably like four feet apart. I've got two moringa trees, an elderberry, and then a Haas avocado and a Brogdon avocado, all in this tiny space. There are a lot of fruiting type trees and plants to choose from, and some of them are obviously tropical trees that won't survive in colder climates. So what I suggest is that you go to a local fruit tree nursery, not a big box store, and review the selection that they have. Local nurseries will carry the types of fruiting trees and plants that will actually produce in your area, and they should be cultivars that are cold hardy enough for your area, which is important so you don't have to worry about your winter cold killing your fruit trees. And another fruit that can be planted this month in April for cold climate gardeners only, like zone seven, and below is strawberries. Strawberries are a spring and summer crop for you, so plant strawberry crowns as soon as your last spring frost date has passed and the ground is workable. Hot climate gardeners with mild winters, no snow, we grow strawberries from fall through spring. So it is too late for us, but plan on planting strawberry crowns again in October. Just to show you some more fruit trees that I have in my tiny backyard. Right here is the Kerry mango. This is a dwarf cultivar. I absolutely love this variety. The mangoes that it produces are like fiber so it's super creamy, almost like a flan like texture and very honey sweet. This is the tree that changed my opinion because I have to admit, I did not like mangoes before I started growing this particular variety. And then about eight feet away is a Florida Prince peach tree. I love stone fruits. They're so easy to grow. And once the trees are mature, they produce so much for you. So I made sure to get myself a good peach tree. And if you've never had a tree ripened peach, you're in for a real treat because the ones you buy at the grocery store are really hard and crunchy. That is not how a peach is supposed to be. When I harvest these things off the tree, they're juicy and they're very soft, not in a bad way, but just totally different than the peaches you buy at the grocery store. And then another eight feet away is a Sun Racer nectarine. Same thing as the peaches. The tree ripened nectarines are amazing as well. I think they tap out at around 15 feet as well. But again, I kind of keep everything trimmed down to a height that is easy for me to get to and harvest everything. And I'm just going to address this right now because I'm I'm sure the comment section is gonna go crazy for the fact that my trees are right next to my privacy fence. They're fine, they're all dwarf trees. They're not gonna grow into some big like oak tree or something that will mess up my fence. They have been here for probably four years now. This is as big as they're gonna get. And if they start getting out of control for some reason, I just cut the branches off and away from the fence. So far it's been fine. I wanna show you guys my kale 
patch really quick. I have kale growing all around my garden, but this patch right here is a bunch of lacinato types, which is my absolute favorite. This one right here is called Black Magic. This one is Dazzling Blue, and this one is just the regular lacinato, also goes by the names of Dinosaur Kale or Black Tuscan Kale. This is by far my favorite type of kale, especially if you're a hot climate gardener. These plants tolerate the heat more than any other type of kale that I grow. The other kales tend to die off in my garden by the time March rolls around. It's just getting way too hot. But these, if planted in a spot that gets some afternoon shade, will survive for a couple years. I actually had one that survived over two years right here in this spot because it gets afternoon shade and it survived two hurricanes too. Just insane. That thing was taller than I was. So that is why I absolutely love lacinato type kales and I grow a bunch of them in my garden. All right, everyone. Hopefully that gave you a lot of ideas for things you need to start growing right now. Lastly, let's discuss important garden tasks, tips, and reminders for the month of April. My first tip is managing the pests. This depends on the type of insect. If it's a chewing insect like worms or caterpillars that eat leaves, use BT, which I mentioned earlier in this video. Some worms are just a little tougher than most, like the corn earworm, so I use spinosad for those instead. If you're dealing with a sucking insect like aphids and spider mites or soft-bodied insects like whiteflies, then use spinosad, neem oil, or organic insecticidal soap. These things kill soft-bodied insects on contact. If you're dealing with a sucking insect that has a hard shell or armor, so to speak, like stink bugs, squash bugs, or leaf-footed bugs, you're going to have to manually remove them off your plants. Wear some gloves and drop them into a bucket of soapy water or vacuum them up with a hand vacuum. Their hard shells protect them against sprays. Spinosad will kill their nymphs, which are red and black in color, because they don't have their hard shells yet. Scale is another type of sucking insect with a hard shell. There are lots of different types of scale. Some have smooth, black, shiny exteriors. Others are more round and brown in color. And another type I've seen is called barnacle scale. They're gray or white with a bumpy shell that looks just like barnacles. Scale sucks the juices out of your plants and in large numbers can kill it. To kill scale, you need to smother them out by spraying with several applications of horticultural oil. If it gets really bad, I suggest you use Azimax. My next set of tips has to do with disease management. I garden organically for the most part thanks to these practices. Number one, clean out any old, dead, and decaying leaves and debris. They are hosts for the pathogens that cause disease and they attract pests. Number two, vertical garden as much as possible. This picks the plants up off the ground, making it harder for pests to get on them and opens the plants up to better airflow so leaves dry faster. And lastly, just another reminder to spray with one cup of hydrogen peroxide per gallon of water to treat all sorts of leaf diseases. Usually I will spray every five to seven days until I start to notice that disease go away. And if it rains a lot, like it does here in Florida, then you know the diseases are about to get out of control. So monitor extra closely and spray if needed. The next reminder is that the heat is coming. If you wanna grow things under shade cloth, it's time to start thinking about building shade cloth structures and having all of the supplies for that in place at home. I know some of you are still under snow, even in April. So you're probably like, what is she talking about? But it is very quickly going to be unbearably hot for some of us. Personally, I have not tried using shade cloth yet because to be honest, I'm just too lazy to go ahead and install all of that stuff. Instead, I strategically place certain plants around the garden. Like I plant my kale in a spot that gets bright morning sun with afternoon shade, so it's fine during the summer. Or I plant herbs and peppers in a container or grow bag so I can move them into a more shady spot. I also have a lot of things growing in green stock garden towers in a spot that gets afternoon shade. Or I just open up my patio umbrella, which creates the shade. I don't deny that shade cloth works. I just don't want to put in all the work of installing. It. If any of you have easy shade cloth setups, tag me in your pictures on social media just to send me some ideas. Well, that's it for April. I hope you all like this list I put together and it helps you with your spring and summer gardens. If I missed any seed or plant ideas, feel free to drop a comment below. If you enjoyed this video, a big thumbs up would mean a lot to me and helps out my channel more than you know. Thanks for watching and happy gardening.